Hi, fifth graders. So this is the beginning of week four at home. Um, I sure wish we were going back to school soon, but um, we got another month at least, and um, we're just gonna keep keep doing stuff at home and keep meeting in um, at our class meetings and keep in touch with each other. And we're gonna continue our book, um, My Side of the Mountain. And right now we are um, on page 68 and we're gonna to read to page 93 today. So it's kind of a longer reading and um, it's only two chapters. So the last time we read, um, Sam was um, working with Frightful and, um, and it was starting to be more busy in the forest because hikers were starting to come and um, and Sam was um, still getting ready for the winter um, and getting his food ready and saved and um, put away in his tree and put away in the tree he was making into his storage um, area for food for the winter. Um, and then uh, last week we talked about whether you guys think it's okay that Sam is uh, is training Frightful, the peregrine falcon, um, even though Frightful is starting to learn how to hunt for himself and maybe would prefer to be to go out in the wild and be able to live in the wild still. Um, so uh, people had different opinions about that. Okay. So this chapter is called In Which I Find a, live a Real Live Man. One of the gasping joys of summer was my daily bath in the spring. It was cold water, I never stayed in long, but it woke me up and started me into the day with a vengeance. I would tether frightful to a hemlock bow above me and splash her from time to time. She would suck in her chest, look startled, and then shake. While I bathed and washed, she preened. Huddled down in the water between the ferns and moss, I scrubbed myself with the bark of the slippery elm. It gets soapy when you rub it. Okay, so slippery elm's a new, um, a new plant that we're hearing about, a new tree that gets soapy. So it's like he's finding soap. The frogs would hop out and let me in, and the wood thrush would come to the edge of the pool to see what was happening. Wood thrush is a bird. In fact, there's a picture here of Sam taking a bath and the wood thrush is right there. That's the bird. We were a happy gathering, me shouting, frightful preening, and wood thrush cocking its pretty head. Occasionally the barren weasel would pop up and glance furtively at us. He didn't care for water. How he stayed glossy and clean was a mystery to me until he came to the boulder beside our bath pool one day, wet with dew from the ferns. He licked himself until he was polished. One morning there was a rustle in the leaves above. Instantly, Frightful had it located. I had learned to look where Frightful looked when there was disturbances in the forest. She always saw life before I could focus my eyes. She was peering into the hemlock above us. Finally, I too saw it, a young raccoon. It was chittering and now, that all eyes were upon it became coming down the tree. And so Frightful and I met Jesse Coon James, the bandit of the Gribbly Farm. So he has another friend that he calls, another animal that he has a nickname for. He came head first down our private bath, a scrabbly skinny young raccoon. He must have been from a late litter for he was not very big and certainly not well fed. Whatever had been Jesse C. James's past, it was awful. Perhaps he was an orphan, perhaps he had been thrown out of his home by his mother, as his eyes were somewhat crossed and looked a little peculiar. In any event, he had come to us for help, I thought, and so Frightful and I led him home and fed him. In about a week, he fattened up. His crumply hair smoothed out, and with a little ear scratching and back rubbing, Jesse C. James became a devoted friend. He also became useful. He slept somewhere in the dark tops of the hemlocks all day long, unless he saw us start for the stream. 
Then, tree by tree, limb by limb, Jesse followed us. At the stream, he was the most, u most useful muscle digger that any boy could have. Jesse could find mussels where three men could not. He would start to eat them, and if he ate them, he got full and wouldn't dig any more. So I took them away from him until he found me all I wanted. Then I let him have some. Mussels are good. Here's a few notes about how to fix them. Scrub mussels in spring water. Dump them into bo boiling water with salt. Boil five minutes. Remove and cool in the juice. Take out meat. Eat by dipping in acorn paste flavored with a smudge of garlic and green apples. Frightful took care of the small game supply, and now that she was an expert hunter, we had rabbit stew, pheasant pot pie, and an occasional sparrow, which I generously gave to Frightful. As fast as we removed the rabbits and pheasants, new ones replaced them. Beverages during the hot summer became my chore, largely because no one else wanted them. I found some sassafras I found some sassafras trees at the edge of the road one day, dug up a good supply of roots, peeled and dried them. Sassafras tea is about as good as anything you want to drink. I dried great bunches of this and hung them from the roof of the tree room together with the leaves of winterberry. All these fragrant plants are I also used in cooking to give a new taste to some not so good foods. The room in the tree smelled of smoke and mint. It was the best smelling tree in the Catskill Mountains. Life was leisurely. I was warm, well fed. One day while I was down the mountain, I returned home by way of old farmhouse site to check the apple crop. Remember there's apple trees at the, um, the site of the old cabin. They were summer apples and they were about ready to be picked. I had gathered a pouch full and had sat down under the tree to eat a few and think about how I would dry them to use them in winter when Frightful dug her talons into my shoulder so hard, I winced. Be gentle, bird, I said to her. I got her talons out and put her on a log where I watched her with some alarm. She was as, as alert as a high tension wire, her head cocked so that her ears, just membranes under her feathers, were pointed east. She evidently heard a sound that pained her. She opened her beak. Whatever it was, I could hear nothing, though I strained my ears, cupped them, and wished she would speak. Frightful was my ears as well as my eyes. She could hear things long before I. When she grew tense, I listened or looked. She was scared this time. She turned round and round on a log, looked up at a tree for a perch, lifted her wings to fly, and then stood still and listened. Then I heard it. A police siren sounded far down the road. The sound grew louder and louder, and I grew afraid. Then I said, no, Frightful, if they are after me, they there won't be a siren. They'll just slip up on me quietly. No sooner had I said this that the siren wound down and apparently stopped on the road at the foot of the mountain. I got up to run to my tree, but I had, gotten I had not gotten past the walnut before the patrol car started up again and screamed away. We started home, although it was not late in the afternoon. However, it was hot and thunderheads were building up. So there was gonna be a thunderstorm. I decided to take a swim in the spring and work on the moccasins I had cut out several days ago. Moccasins are shoes. With the squad car still on my mind, we slipped quietly into the hemlock forest. Once again, Frightful almost sent me through the crown of the forest by digging her talons in my shoulder. I looked at her. She was staring at our home. I looked too. Then I stopped for I could make out the form of a man stretched between the sleeping house and the store tree. Softly, tree by tree, Frightful and I approached him. The man was asleep. I could have left and camped in the gorge again, but my enormous desire to see another human being overcame my fear of being discovered. We stood above the man. He did not move, so Frightful lost interest in my fellow being. She tried to hop to her stump and preen. I grabbed her leash, however, as I wanted to think before awakening, however, as I wanted to think before awakening him. Frightful flapped. I held her wings to her body as her flapping was noisy to me, apparently not so to the man. The man did not stir. It is hard to realize that the rustle of a falcon's wings is not much noise to a man from the city, because by now one beat of her wings and I would awaken from a sound sleep as if a shot had gone off. 
The stranger slept on. I realized how long I'd been in the mountains. Right at that moment, as I looked at his unshaven face, his close cropped hair and his torn clothes, I thought of the police siren and put two and two together. An outlaw, I said to myself. Wow, I had to think what to do with an outlaw before I awoke in him. Would he be troublesome? Would he be mean? Should I go and live in the gorge until he moved on? How I wanted to hear his voice, to tell him about the Baron and Jesse C. James, to say words out loud. I really did not want to hide from him. Besides, he might be hungry, I thought. Finally, I spoke. Hi, I said. I was delighted to see him roll over, open his eyes, and look up. He seemed startled, so I reassured him. It's all right, they've gone. If you don't tell on me, I won't tell on you. When he heard this, he sat up and seemed to relax. Oh, he said. Then he leaned against the tree and added, thanks. He evidently was thinking this over, for he propped his head on his elbow and studied me closely. You're a sight for sore eyes, he said and smiled. He had a nice smile. In fact, he looked nice and not like an outlaw at all. His eyes were very blue, and although tired, they did not look scared or hunted. However, I talked quickly before he could get up and run away. So here's a picture of the outlaw and Sam. And Sam's just assuming he's an outlaw, like somebody who's running from the police. And there's Frightful in the background. I don't know anything about you, and I don't want to. You don't know anything about me and don't want to, but you may st stay here if you like. No one is going to find you here. Would you like some supper? It was still early, but he looked hungry. Do you have some? Yes, venison or rabbit? Well, venison. His eyes puckered in question marks. I went to work. He arose, turned around and around, and looked at his surroundings. He whistled softly when I kindled a spark and with the flint and steel. I was now quite quick at this, and I had a tidy fire blazing in a very few minutes. I was so used to doing this myself that it had not occurred to me that it would be interesting to a stranger. Desdemondia, he said. I judged this to be some underworld phrase. At this moment, Frightful, who had been sitting quietly on her stump, began to preen. The outlaw jumped back, then saw she was tied and said, and who is this ferocious looking character? That is frightful. Don't be afraid. She's quite wonderful and gentle. She would be glad to catch you a rabbit for supper if, supper if you would prefer that to venison. Am I dreaming? said the man. I go to sleep by a campfire that looked like it was built by a boy scout and I awaken in the middle of the 18th century. I crawled into the store tree to get the smoked venison and some cat cattail tubers. When I came out again, he was speechless. Uh, my storehouse, I explained. I see, he answered. From that moment on, he did not talk much. He just watched me. I was so busy cooking the best meal that I could possibly get together that I, I didn't say much either. Later, I wrote down that menu, as it was excellent. Brown puffballs and deer fat with little wild garlic. Fill pot with water, put venison in, boil. Wrap tubers and leaves and stick in coals. Cut up apples and boil in can with dog tooth violet bulbs. Raspberries to finish meal. When the meal was ready, I served it to the man in the nicest turtle shell I had. I had to whittle him a fork out of the crotch of a twig as Jesse Coon James had gone off with the others. He ate and ate and ate. And when he was done, he said, may I call you Thoreau? And there's the dog tooth violet that he sketched in his book and he's referring to Henry David Thoreau who lived in the wilderness and was a writer. That will do nicely, I said. Then I paused just to let him know that I knew a little bit about him too. I smiled and said, I will call you Bando. His eyebrows went up. He cocked his head, shrugged his shoulders and answered, that's close enough. With this, he sat and thought, I felt I had offended him, so I spoke. I will be glad to help. I will teach you how to live off the land. It's very easy. No one need find you. His eyebrows gathered together again. This was characteristic of Bando when he was concerned, and so I was sorry I had mentioned his past. After all, outlaw or no outlaw, he was an adult, and I still felt unsure of myself around adults. 
I changed the subject. Let's get some sleep, I said. Where do you sleep, he asked. All this time sitting and talking with me, he had not seen the entrance to my tree. I was pleased. Then I beckoned, walked a few feet to the left, pushed back the deer hide door, and showed Bando my secret. Thoreau, he said, you are quite wonderful. He went in. I lit the turtle candle for him. He explored, tried the bed, came out and shook his head until I thought it would roll off. We didn't say much more that night. I let him sleep on my bed. His feet hung off, but he was comfortable, he said. I stretched out by the fire. The ground was dry, the night warm, and I could sleep on anything now. I got up early and had breakfast ready when Bando came stumbling out of the tree. We ate crayfish and he really honestly seemed to like them. It takes a little time to acquire a taste for wild foods, so Bando surprised me the way he liked the menu. Of course, he was hungry and that helped. That day we didn't talk much, just went over the mountain collecting some foods. I wanted to dig up the tubers of the Solomon seal from the big garden of them on the other side of the gorge. We fished, we swam a little, and I told him I hoped to make a raft pretty soon so I could float into the deep water and perhaps catch a bigger fish. When Bando heard this, he took my ax and immediately began to cut young trees for this purpose. I watched him and said, you must have lived on a farm or something. At that moment, a bird sang. The wood peewee, said Bando, stopping his work. He stepped into the woods, seeking it. Now I was astonished. How would you know about a wood peewee in your business? I grew bold enough to ask. And just what do you think my business is, he said, as I followed him. Well, you're not a minister, right. And you're not a doctor or a lawyer, correct. You're not a businessman or a sailor, no, I am not. Nor do you dig ditches, I do not. Well, guess. Suddenly I wanted to know for sure, so I said it. You are a murderer or a thief or a racketeer, and you are hiding out. Bando stopped looking for the peewee. He turned and stared at me. At first I was frightened. A bandit might do anything, but he wasn't mad. He was laughing. He had a good deep laugh and it kept coming out of him. I smiled, then grinned and laughed with him. What's funny, Bando? I asked. I like that, he finally said. I like that a lot. The tickle deep inside him kept, chuckling, kept him chuckling. I had no more to say, so I ground my heel into the dirt while I waited for him to get over the fun and explain it all to me. Thoreau, my friend, I am just a college English teacher lost in the Catskills. I came out to hike around the woods, get, got completely lost yesterday, found your fire, and fell asleep beside it. I was hoping the scouts master and his troop would be back for supper and help me home. Oh no, my comment. Then I laughed. You see, Bando, before I found you, I heard some squad cars screaming up the road. Occasionally, you read about bandits that hide out in the forest, so I was sure that you were someone they were looking for. We gave up the peewee and went back to the raft making, talking very fast now and laughing a lot. He was fun. Then something sad occurred to me. Well, if you're not a bandit, you will have to go home very soon, and there's no point in teaching you how to live on fish and bark and plants. I could stay for a little while, he said. This is summer vacation. I must admit I had not planned to eat crayfish on my vacation, but I am rather getting to like it. Maybe I can stay until your school opens, he went on. That's after Labor Day, isn't it? I was very still, thinking how to answer that. Bando sensed this, then he turned to me with a big grin. You really mean you are going to try to winter it out here? I think I can. Well, he sat down, rubbed his forehead in his hands and looked at me. Thoreau? I have led a varied life, dishwasher, sax player, teacher. To me, it has been an interesting life. Just now, it seems very dull. He sat a while with his head down, then looked up at the mountains and the rocks and the trees. I heard him sigh. Let's go fish. We can finish this another day. That is how I came to know Bando. We became very good friends in the week or 10 days that he stayed with me, and he helped me a lot. We spent several days gathering white oak acorns and ground nuts, harvesting the blueberry crop and smoking fish. We flew frightful every day just for the pleasure of lying on our backs in the meadow and watching her mastery of the sky. I had lots of meat, so what she caught those days was all hers. It was pleasant time, warm with occasional thunder showers, some of which we stayed out in. We talked about books, 
He did know a lot of books and could quote exciting things from them. One day, Bando went to town and came back with five pounds of sugar. I want to make blueberry jam, he announced. All those excellent berries and no jam. He worked two days at this. He knew how to make jam. He watched his pa make it in Mississippi, but we got stuck on what to put it in. I wrote this one night. August 29th. The raft is almost done. Bando has promised to stay until we can sail out into the deep fishing holes. Bando and I felt some, found some clay along the stream bank. It was slick as ice. Bando thought it would make good pottery. He shaped some jars and lids. They look good, not Wedgwood, he said, but containers. Wedgwood is expensive pottery. We dried them on the rock in the meadow and later Bando made a clay oven and baked them in it. He thinks they might hold the blueberry jam he, he's been making. Bando got the fire hot by blowing on it with some homemade bellows that he fa fashioned from one of my skins that he tied together like a balloon. A reed is the nozzle. August 30th. It was a terribly hot day for Bando to be firing clay jars, but he stuck with it. The, they look jam worthy, as he says, and he fills, filled three of them tonight. The jam is good. The pots remind me of crude flower pots without the hole in the bottom. Some of the lids don't fit. Bando says he will go home and read more about pottery making so he could do a better job next time. We like the jam. We eat it on hard acorn pancakes. Later, Bando met the Baron Weasel today for the first time. I don't know where the Baron has been on this past week, but suddenly he appeared on the rock and nearly jumped down Bando's shirt collar. Bando said he liked the Baron the best when he was in his hole. September 3rd, Bando taught me how to make willow whistles, whistles today. He and I went to the stream and cut two fat twigs about eight inches long. He slipped the bark on them. That means he pulled the wood of the bark, leaving a tube. He made a mouthpiece on one end, cut a hole beneath it, and used the wood to slide up and down like a trombone. We played music until the moon came up. Bando could even play jazz on the willow whistles. They are wonderful instruments, sounding much like the wind in the top of the hemlocks. Sad tunes are best suited to willow whistles. When we played the young voyager, tears came to our eyes. It was so sad. There were no more notes for many days. Bando had left me saying, goodbye, I'll see you at Christmas. I was so lonely that I kept sewing my moccasins to keep myself busy. I sewed every free minute for four days, and when they were finished, I began a glove to protect my hand from frightful sharp talons. One day, when I was thinking very hard about being alone, Frightful gave her gentle call of love and contentment. I looked up. Bird, I said. I had almost forgotten how we used to talk. She made tiny movements with her beak and fluffed her feathers. This was a language I had forgotten since Bando came. It meant that she was glad to see me and hear me and that she was well fed and content. I picked her up and squeaked into her neck feathers. She moved her beak, turned her bright head, and bit my nose very gently. Jesse Coon James came down from the trees for the first time in 10 days. He finished my fish dinner. Then, just before dark, the Baron came up on his boulder and scratched and cleaned and played with a fern leaf. I had the feeling that we were all back together again. And this is a picture of the, the whistles that uh, Sam and Bando made. And his note says, this is how you make slide willow whistles. So this last chapter is, um, is not very long and it's called In Which the Autumn Provides Food and Loneliness. September blazed a trail into the mountains. First she burned the grasses. The grasses seeded and were harvested by the mice and the winds. Then she sent the squirrels and chipmunks running boldly through the forest, collecting and hiding nuts. Then she frosted the aspen leaves and left them sunshine yellow. Then she gathered the birds together in flocks and the mountaintop was full of songs and twitterings and flashing wings. The birds were ready to move to the south and I, Sam Gribbley, felt just wonderful, just wonderful. I pushed the raft down the stream and gathered arrow leaf bulbs, cattail tubers, bulrush roots, and the nut-like nut tubers of the sedges. So a lot of new plants there. 
And then the crop of crickets appeared and Frightful hopped all over the meadow, snagging them in her great talons and eating them. I tried them because I heard they are good. I think it was another species of cricket that was meant. I think the field cricket would taste excellent if you were starving. I was not starving, so I preferred to listen to them. I abandoned the crickets and went back to the goodness of the earth. I smoked fish and rabbit and dug wild onions by the pouchful and raced September for her crop. So here's a picture of cattail. And then another picture of um, wild onion that he drew in his uh, field notebook. October 15th. Today the barren weasel looked moldy. I couldn't get near him enough to see what was the matter with him, but it occurs to me that he might be changing his summer fur for his white winter mantle. If he is, it is an itchy process. He scratches a lot. Seeing the Baron changing his mantle for the winter awoke the first fears in me. I wrote the, that note on a little birch bark curled up in my bed and shivered. So some animals change their fur for the season. So he's put, he is like shedding his summer fur and he's growing a bigger, thicker fur for the winter. The snow and the cold and the long, lifeless months are ahead, I thought. The wind was blowing hard and cool across the mountain. I lit my candle, took out the rabbit and squirrel hides I had been saving, and began rubbing and kneading them to softness. The baron was getting a new suit for winter. I must have one, too. Some fur underwear, some mittens, fur-lined socks. Frightful, who was sitting on the footpost of the bed, yawned, fluffed, and thrust her head into the slate-gray feathers of her back. She slept. I worked for several hours. I must say here that I was beginning to wonder if I should not go home for the winter and come back again in the spring. Everything in the forest was getting prepared for the harsh months. Jesse Coon James was as fat as a barrel. He came down the tree slowly, his fat falling in a roll over his shoulders. The squirrels were working and storing food. They were building leaf nests. The skunks had burrows and plugged themselves in at dawn with bunches of leaves, no drafts could reach them. As I thought of the skunks and all the animals preparing themselves against winter, <laughs> I realized suddenly that my tree would be as cold as air if I did not somehow find a way to heat it. Notes. Today I rafted out into the deep pools of the creek to fish. It was a lazy sort of autumn day, the sky clear, the leaves beginning to brighten, the air warm. I stretched out on my back because the fish weren't biting and hummed. My line jerked and I sat up to pull, but it was too late. However, I was not too late to notice that I had drifted into the bank, the very bank where Bando had dug the clay for the jam pots. At that moment, I knew what I was going to do. I was going to build a fireplace out of clay, even fashion a little chimney of clay. It would be small, but enough to warm the tree during the long winter. Next day. I dragged the clay up the mountain to my tree in my second best pair of city pants. I tied the bottoms of the legs, stuffed them full, and as I looked down on my strange cargo, I thought of scarecrows and Halloween. I thought of the gang dumping ash cans on Third Avenue and soaping up the windows. Suddenly I was terribly lonely. The air smelled of leaves and cool wind from the steam hugged me. The warblers in the tree above me seemed happy and glad about their trip south. I stopped halfway up the mountain and dropped my head. I was lonely and on the verge of tears. Suddenly there was a flash, a pricking sensation on my leg, and I looked down in time to see the Baron leaping from my pants to the cover of a fern. He scared the loneliness right out of me. I ran after him, chased him up the mountain, losing him from time to time in the ferns and crow feet. We stormed into the camp, an awful sight, the Baron bouncing and screaming ahead of me and dragging that half scarecrow of clay. I frightful, frightful took one look and flew to the end of her leash. She doesn't like the Baron and watches him well, like a hawk. I don't like her, like to leave her alone. End notes, must make fireplace. It took three days to get the fireplace worked out so that it didn't smoke me out of the tree like a bee. It was an enormous problem. In the first place, the chimney sagged because the clay was too heavy to hold itself up. So I had to get some dry grasses to work into it so it could hold its own weight. I whittled out one of the old knot holes to let the smoke out and built the chimney down from this. 
Of course, when the clay dried, it pulled away from the tree and the smoke poured back onto me. So I tried sealing the leak with pit pine pitch and that worked all right. But then the funnel over the fire bed cracked and I had to put wooden props under that. The wooden props burned and I could see that this wasn't going to work either. So I went down the mountain to the site of the old Gribbly farmhouse and looked around for some iron spikes and some sort of metal. I took the wooden shovel that I had carved from board and dug, out, dug around what I thought must have been the back door or possibly the wood house. I found a hinge, old handmade nails that would come in handy, and finally, treasure of treasures, the axle of an old wagon. It was much too big. I had no hacksaw to cut it into smaller pieces, and I was not strong enough to heat it and hammer it apart. Besides, I didn't have anything but a small wooden mallet I'd made. I carried my trophies home and sat down before my tree to fix dinner and feed Frightful. The evening was cooling down for a frost. I looked at Frightful's warm feathers. I didn't even have a deer hide for a blanket. I had used the two I had for a door and a pair of pants. I wished I might grow feathers. I tossed Frightful off my fist and she flashed through the trees and out over the meadow. She went with a determination strange to her. She is going to leave, I cried. I have never seen her fly so wildly. I pushed the smoked fish aside and ran to the meadow. I whistled and whistled until my mouth was dry and no more whistle came. I ran onto the big boulder. I could not see her. Wildly, I waved the lure. I licked my lips and whistled again. The sun was a cold, steely color and it dipped below the mountain. The air was now brisk and frightful was gone. I was sure she had suddenly taken off on the migration. My heart was sore and pounding. I had enough food, I was sure. Frightful was absolutely not necessary for survival. But I was so fond of her now. She was more than a bird. I knew I must have her back to talk to and play with if I was going to make it through this winter. I whistled. Then I heard a cry in the grasses up near the white birches. In the gathering darkness, I saw movement. I think I flew to the spot and there she was. She had caught herself a bird. I rolled into the grass beside her and clutched her jessies. She didn't intend to leave, but I was going to make sure that she didn't. I grabbed her so swiftly that my hand hit a rock and I bruised my knuckles. The rock was flat and narrow and long. It was the answer to my fireplace. I picked up Frightful in one hand and the stone in the other and I laughed at the cold, steely sun as it slipped out of sight because I knew I was going to be warm. This flat stone was what I needed to hold up the funnel to finish my fireplace, and that's what I did with it. I broke it into two pieces, set one on each side under the funnel, lit the fire, closed the flap of the door, and listened to the wind bring the first frost to the mountain. I was warm. Then I noticed something dreadful. Frightful was sitting on the bedpost, her head under her wings. She was toppling. She jerked, out, jerked her head out of the feathers, her eyes looked glassy. She is sick, I said. I picked her up, stroked her, and we both might have died there if I had not opened the tent flap to get her some water. The cold night air revived her. Air, I said. The fireplace used up all the oxygen. I've got to ventilate this place. I sat out in the cold for a long time because I was more than a little afraid of what our end might have been. I put out the fire, took the door down, and wrapped up in it. Frightful and I slept with the good frost nipping our faces. Notes. I cut out several more knot holes to let air in and out of the tree room. I tried it today. I have Frightful on my first fist watching her. It's been about two hours and she hasn't fainted and I haven't gone numb. I can still write and see clearly. Test. Frightful's healthy face. So Sam almost killed both himself and Frightful because... He didn't cut holes in the tree or let any air in when he had the fire going. So all of the fire was using up the oxygen in, um, the, in the tree. And then it was giving off um, smoke and it, it was making it so he, they couldn't breathe. So he had to try to figure that out too. So your discussion question will be on Schoology and... Um, We'll talk more about some of the new animals and plants that were in these two chapters. And on Schoology, I also put um, 
a whole folder of information about some of the animals that we've read about in the book so far. So I want you to go ahead and check those out. Okay, see you next time.